Welcome to my channel, I'm Steve Down, this is my guitar. If you're just joining us, we're finishing a series on what the heck is modal jazz, um, and we're using Milestones by Miles Davis, and specifically Cannonball Adderley's incredible solo uh, as a vehicle for kind of exploring it, uh, explaining it, and also to give you some ideas on how to approach modal jazz if you're a soloist. So just to recap, in the first episode, we looked at what modal jazz is. Um, we explained some of the characteristics of modal jazz um, and the general concept of it. Um, and we also looked at the head um, through a chord melody. <laughs> In the second episode, we looked at the first A section of his solo and we looked at the G Dorian scale. Uh, in the third episode, we looked at the B section and the second A section, the short second A section. Um, and that was where we looked at the A Aeolian scale. Um, then I took a break and we looked at So What by Miles Davis and I uh, transcribed his uh, his solo and also the head as well for guitar. And then last week we looked at the beginning of Cannonball's second chorus in the solo. He only takes two choruses. Uh, and we looked at the first A section, so that was um, back on the G Dorian again. Uh, and there was that incredible uh, sweet picking legato uh, lick that took me ages to get. Hopefully you guys have nailed it. So this week we're going to be finishing off the whole thing before I do a montage next week of the entire transcription. And this week we're looking at the B section and the final little A section that he plays again. Uh, so we're back in the territory of A Aeolian and then also G Dorian for the final A section. So before we get into today's lesson, just wanna say a big thanks to all the patrons this week. Uh, we've got some new ones. So uh, welcome to Thomas, Christoph, William, Nathan, and Oliver. Christoph, I hope I pronounced your name right. This is really good practice for me pronouncing names that I'm not so familiar with. And also welcome to all of the, the subscribers. We're heading towards 1,000 subscribers on YouTube, which is amazing. Um, I didn't think I'd ever get this many. So yeah, obviously you guys can put up with my dreary voice and possibly too much information. So thanks. If you'd like to get the transcriptions, backing tracks, exercise packs, and a little bit more as well, then head over to Patreon. The link is on the screen here. If you uh, just want to do a one-off support, then there's a link to buy me a coffee below. Um, and that's just $5 and it's just to say thanks. But only if you um, have enough financial capability to do that. And if you haven't got any financial capability and you do want to support and just say thanks, then just hit that subscribe button. Uh, don't forget to hit the bell if you want to get uh, regular updates and also hit the like button as well because I think it helps people to find uh, videos like this uh, when they're looking for stuff on Modal Jazz. So, on with the lesson. So this lesson isn't going to be a very long lesson. The main thing that I want to pick up from this is the recycling and reusing of his material. Those of you with keen ears and keen eyes will notice that that particular phrase that he just played and it's five bars, he's recycled some of the material from the first B section in the last chorus of his solo. <laughs> Rhythmically speaking, it's the same kind of thing where it's quite flowy lines that are quite across the beat um, and it's all collections of notes that are quite speedy. Um, melodically speaking, he's using the same kind of notes from the A Aeolian, but specifically the tonic, the ninth, the minor third, the fifth and the sixth. Um, and he's targeting in this one certain notes at the top of each phrase, just like he did in the first chorus as well. Articulation wise, it's quite legato again. So he's using similar techniques, but he's approaching it slightly differently each time, as you'll see if you compare and contrast the two. 
Um, it's the same kind of melody, same kind of rhythm, same kind of articulation, but it is different. He's approaching it slightly differently. So in the interests of your own soloing exploration um, over this particular piece, and in any piece actually, here's three options of how you can recycle your material and vary it slightly so it's not boring or a complete repetition of the previous phrase. So the first one is melody, second one is rhythm, the third one is articulation. So that slides, bends, hammer-ons, pull-offs, that kind of thing. So here's the initial idea. So we've got this kind of chromatic thing at the top, going from the sixth down to the fifth, and then going up the A minor arpeggio, and then going from the fifth down to the ninth, and then going chromatically between the ninth and the tonic, flat nine, and then on to the actual tonic itself. In the example, I swung this. Okay, so that's our initial idea. So I realized during the editing of this video, I should probably expand a little bit on why I used an F sharp. Um, when I referred to it as a sixth, that's what I meant, a major sixth, rather than the sixth that was actually contained within the A Aeolian scale, which would be the F natural. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about why I did that. I'm not referring to an A Dorian scale here. This is literally a chromatic approach note. So this is something that you'll see quite often in jazz where they'll approach it from beforehand, but they're not necessarily playing a modal scale. Um, obviously our focus here is the A Aeolian scale, not the A Dorian scale. So that F sharp is an approach note. So it's just a chromatic passing note for me to get to F and then to E and then finally into the A Aeolian scale. So I just wanted to clear that one up for you. That's why I'm using that sixth note and I'm referring to it as a sixth note because it's the sixth note of the scale. But if we were being really technical with it, we would refer to it as a major sixth rather than a minor sixth because the F sharp obviously is a major sixth in relation to the A major scale. I hope that clears it up. Back into the video. So the way we can vary this melodically is we can take that line and we can take the arc of the melody, whatever the shape of the melody is, and we can use the same notes from the same scale, but we can start on a different note and follow the same arc. So here's the example. And so you'll see, instead of starting on the sixth, I've started on the ninth. And I followed that down chromatically down to the tonic. And then I've jumped down to the minor third and I'm gonna come up the arpeggio. So I've gone minor third, fifth, and then tonic. So down the chromatically from the ninth to the tonic, up the arpeggio. And then instead of going to the fifth, I've gone to the flat seven. And then I'm gonna follow that down, follow it through notes that from the Aeolian scale. Instead of going chromatically to the end, I didn't like that melodically when I moved it around in the scale. Instead, I went from the flat third up to the fourth. So down chromatically from the ninth to the tonic, up the arpeggio, start on the flat seven, follow it down the scale. Instead of going chromatically, I go to the flat third and up to the fourth. And there you've got, there you've got something that is a variation melodically of that initial line. over the exact same place in the structure, over exactly the same chord, and it's a variation. So it's something that sounds just like the original, but not quite. So the next way we can um, reuse and recycle our material is rhythmically. So here's the initial idea. So just straight swung eighths there, um, and I've, I haven't left any spaces in that at all. It's completely full, the bar. Um, here is a variation rhythmically that you can do of that line. So the way that I'm varying this rhythmically is I'm, I'm actually delaying the start. So I'm going three, four, one, and then starting the chromatic descent. And for the next phrase, instead of using swung quavers, I'm actually using triplets here. And I'm doing a little kind of back and forth, a little trill between the E and the F. So, so chromatically from the top. And you'll see there that that's still the same line. Yeah, I've added that little trill in, but it's still the same line, but I've just varied it a little bit. Um, instead of having swung eighths, I've got triplets. And then at the end, I've just kept the things the same. 
but you'll notice that obviously because I've moved everything on, it finishes in a different place in the bar. So that's different from. And then the final way you can do it is by adding articulation. Now I've gone a bit ridiculous on this last example. Um, this is probably not something that I would play in reality, but it's just to show you all of the different ways that you can vary it. So here's the initial example. And here's the way that I've done a variation with articulation. Remember that's bends, slides, hammer-ons and pull-offs. So yeah, this is a kind of John Schofield thing um, that he uses with pull-offs, with his lines. He very rarely plays that. He'll normally play and pull off to the last one. So he, quite often you'll see him, if he's got a, a phrase that's got three notes, um, he'll either pull off from the first to the second and then play the third, or he'll play the first and then pull off from the second to the third. And then instead of going up the arpeggio like this, I've gone from the A to the C and then slid up to the fifth on the same string. So I've used a slide. And then to end the phrase, I'm using hammer-ons and pull-offs. So there, I'm going from the 15th, using my first finger, and then doing a little trill back and forth between the C and the D, and then sliding back into the ninth, and then doing the chromatic descent through the flat line to the tonic. So. So again, I know that that's not necessarily a phrase that I would probably use. It's quite tricky and um, quite fiddly. It's not necessarily a phrase that I would probably use live, but it's something where you could probably extract little kind of cells from that phrase and use some of those ideas. So the hammer on and pull off thing from here is a great idea or to vary that kind of phrase. So there's some ways that you can uh, vary your lines and recycle and reuse material melodically, rhythmically, and with articulation as well. And that's exactly what Cannonball's doing here, is using the same kind of line from that B section, but he's varying it ever so slightly melodically, and he's also varying it rhythmically as well. He's doing a lot of delays as to where he starts each line and everything. Um, and then also articulation-wise, um, with the legato, um, he's varying it as well. So let's look at the next four bars. So there's not very much more in these four bars. Um, basically, this is just playing around with the A minor seven arpeggio, um, and it's all off of the back of that um, long kind of flowing legato phrase from earlier. So here, all he's doing is approaching the minor third from a semitone below from the ninth, going through the fifth, and then sliding up to the, uh, well, not sliding, because he doesn't slide, but on a guitar you'd slide. Sliding up from below chromatically up into the flat seven, and then going down the arpeggio. So it's a really good idea that you know your A minor seven arpeggio, so here it is. And then because he's done this up and down with the arpeggio, he kind of follows on with this cool little line where he's going down to the tonic. Um, and it's, it's quite hard to hear that because he kind of just trails off dynamically on the recording. So I had to really kind of pump the volume. Um, so don't worry about getting that ending like absolutely perfect because he doesn't really get it perfect on the recording either. So the takeaway from this is just basically to make sure that you know your A minor seven arpeggio um, and where to use it and where to kind of vary it. Um, you can see there that he's kind of approaching certain notes from chromatically from a semitone below and he's adding in some scale notes like the ninth to kind of make it sound interesting. So let's move on to the last seven bars of this B section. <laughs> So the cool thing that I noticed here is he's doing something called displacing down the octave. Well, that's kind of what I call that anyway. I don't know, think there's I don't think there's a technical term for it. Um, but basically, he's kind of jumping down the octave in the middle of his his melody. So the first little phrase that he plays is is that line, um, which is going from the A to the B and then going down a semitone chromatically and then back up to the tonic again. And I've kind of phrased it like that. And then he jumps down the octave. So it kind of provides an answer phrase down an octave. And that's a great thing that you can do in your playing. So you could kind of do this kind of thing. Where you're playing a line on the top register 
and then you're jumping down an octave to answer that line. So it's something that you could try in your own playing. And then again, really important that we know our A minor seven arpeggio rewinds to the one earlier, just to kind of recap. He basically goes up an A minor seven arpeggio. Um, and then comes down, I'm using sweet picking here to do this. So refer to the last lesson if you want some tips and tricks on uh, sweet picking. And then the next thing he does is super cool. He he plays like, it looks like a either a B minor seven flat five um, idea or a G seven idea. And I, I think he's going for a G seven idea because I think he's trying to kind of imply a five one into C. Because remember we're heading back into that A section. If you remember from the last video, he spent a long time trying to kind of convince us that he was in the key of C. And I wonder whether he's trying to do the same thing again. So the little line that he plays after doing the... So he plays that, which, which is some notes from the G7 arpeggio, which is this. So he's kind of going down, I'm doing a pull off from the flat seven and then going down through the scale. And it just sounds like he's doing like a G7 idea because he's got the F there, the D, the B. So, but it could quite easily be a B minus seven flat five idea. Remember that modally our parental scale is C major and within C major, um, we've got that arpeggio that's built on the, no the seventh note, the B, which is B minus seven flat five. So here. And so he could be just, you know, playing around with that idea because we're in a Aeolian, which is a mode of the C major scale, and perhaps he's just trying to provide some variety. I mean, I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, um, but I think that he's trying to provide like a G7 kind of idea, and I think he's trying to superimpose that. So definitely refer back to the last video where I talked more on that. And so the phrase that comes after this, I really think he's in C. Because, because he's enclosing that C and then going up. And we've got the three notes from a C major there. So I really think he's in C. So that seems like a five, one in C to me. But I'm just going to provide the other side of the argument. I, you know, it could be an A minor seven arpeggio. And he does play this line there, which has got notes from the A minor seven. So A, G and E. So it could be that. I think it's a C though. So here comes the cool bit. We're back in the uh, the final A section. We're back into G Dorian again, which remember is this. Again, he's reusing material again. And if you remember, that's what we had in the previous chorus in the A section that follows the B. Um, we had that line again, which if we remember is this line. So it sounds just like it. Again, he's reusing his material, but he's ending it differently. So he's sliding into, so here he's sliding into the tonic. And then we get into this seriously cool little descending line. Basically what he's doing is, I mean, this is something that I would probably use to warm up and it's probably something that he used to uh, understand the arpeggios that are contained diatonically within the F major scale. So basically what he's doing is he's playing each arpeggio from the seventh down, but that would be quite boring. So what he's doing is he's approaching it from a scale note below. And I'm using some pull-offs to make it sound interesting. So I'm going, so I'm approaching it from below and then pulling off each time. Now, you'll notice that in the recording, he approaches the third arpeggio from a chromatic note below. And that kind of provides some, some kind of blues idea because it's a blue note that he's doing there. So that's cool that he's putting that in. That gives a bit of variety. Um, we could continue that whole thing all the way down. So here's an example of that.
and you could use this in your practice um, or you could actually use it in your soloing as well. Remember, he's just used a fragment of an idea, which was probably something that he used, as I said, to understand the diatonic arpeggios that are contained within the major scale. Um, so you could use a tiny fragment of it yourself. Maybe try not to copy what, um, what Cannonball's doing, but try a different area um, of the exercise and add that into your own soloing. And so after he's done that kind of arpeggio idea, um, he comes back up and goes down chromatically. So, so he's going up, giving a kind of C9 idea, and then coming down the scale, he's basically just following the G Dorian all the way down, adding some chromatic notes. So C through B natural chromatic to B flat, and then following the scale down, and then connecting chromatically from C down to A. And then this nice little kind of flurry at the end. And that connects nicely up to Miles' solo. So we're at the end of the whole series. What the heck is modal jazz? I'm hoping that I've managed to unpack at least some of it and given you a basic overview um, and given you a pretty awesome solo to be learning as well. Um, some of the takeaways I just wanted to give you, uh, number one is basically the idea of modal jazz, which is basically to kind of de-emphasize the role of chords, um, get rid of that whole kind of idea of functional harmony um, and the hierarchy of chords. So we're not heading and gravitating towards a one. Um, we're kind of floating around in certain areas. That's why if you listen to stuff like Maiden Voyage, uh, some of Wayne Shorter's stuff off of Speak No Evil, um, the album kind of blue, you'll hear that it is quite floaty sounding, uh, but that's the idea is that they've kind of done away with a hierarchy of chords. And so that's the kind of thing that you'll get in the approach underneath with the chords. And it's also the approach that you'll get from the soloists as well. So as we've seen, Cannonball hasn't really been beholden to functional harmony. He's alluded to it, and that's just his bebop roots. You can take the player out of a bebop gig, but you can't necessarily take the uh, all of the bebop ideas out of the player. So we saw him kind of, you know, superimposing ideas of C um, in an area that is G Dorian, which was really super interesting. Um, and then he's superimposing different arpeggios all the way through. Now, this is something that you will see, obviously, in bebop as well, but it's just it's more prevalent here. And the modal approach forces the improviser to kind of create interest melodically, rhythmically, texturally, timbrally, and also emotionally in his playing as well. Big takeaways from this particular solo is to remember that F is your parental scale and the G Dorian scale basically just starts on G and uses all of the notes from the F major scale. Um, so obviously it creates a G minor scale, but it's not a G natural minor scale, because remember a G natural minor scale would have an E flat in it. And in the key of F, we don't have an E flat. So it's not gonna be a G natural minor scale. It's a different flavor and we call it G Dorian. And then in the B section, we shifted to the uh, mode of A Aeolian, which is the sixth mode of the C major scale. So it's uh, a mode that starts on the sixth note, which is A. Um, and we follow all of the notes of the C major all the way through. Um, and that is actually the natural minor as well. We call this the natural minor. There are obviously other modes. The mode that's built on the third is the Phrygian. The fourth is Lydian. The fifth is Mixolydian. And the seventh is Locrian. We haven't had time to explore all that fully, but that's in some of my other lessons, I do go into that. So if you want to explore the Mixolydian scale, then go and take a look at my series on Hot and Tot and also on Midnight Blue as well. The other thing is to know your arpeggios. So know all of your diatonic arpeggios because that's what you're gonna to use to paint with in your solos. And then how to reuse material. Cannonball has demonstrated time and time again, he's a master of reusing material. So we saw that he was reusing loads of stuff from the B section and then also from that final A section as well. So I hope you've got something out of this. Um, it's not exhaustive by any stretch of the imagination, um, but I hope that I've kind of uh, wetted your taste buds a little bit. Um, for looking at modal jazz. Some albums to check out if you want to get deep into modal jazz is Maiden Voyage by Herbie Hancock, Kind of Blue by Miles Davis and also Milestones by Miles Davis. Um, and then also uh, Speak No Evil by Wayne Shorter as well. There are plenty of others. Um, so feel free to pop those in the comments below if you've got any suggestions for um, some of the watchers. 
Um, but I hope you've enjoyed this series. I'm going to post next week a full video of the full solo and then I'll be taking a week off the week after that to plan the next one and I'm going to be taking a look at the red one which is from I Can See Your House From Here, an album by John Schofield and Pat Metheny. So we're going to be looking at Schofield solo in this one, so more for the Sco fans out there. And I've got my, a good friend of mine, Joe Harris, who's going to be laying down some drums for the backing track on this one. So. Don't forget, if you want all of the transcriptions, backing tracks, exercise, chord scale uh, packs, then head over to Patreon. The link is here. Um, if you want to support me on a one-off fashion, then there's a link to buy me a coffee below. But also just appreciate you hitting that subscribe button and the like button so that other people can find this stuff if they're wanting to explore modal jazz. So have fun, happy practicing, and I'll see you on the next series. Bye. <laughs>